Vinegar is acidic, so you don't want to put vinegar on marble, period. Um, historically, before D2 was around, it's been around about 20 years, um, marble, uh, marble was uh, sometimes clean with um, ammonia in a solution, just regular ammonia. However, it's not that effective. Um, a non-ionic detergent is something that has a neutral pH. Generally, that was recommended. And I'll just talk about history a little, um, that I've worked, collaborated with a lot of groups like the Association for Gravestone Studies. I used to actually um, be in charge of their conservation workshop. Um, and um, back when we go back, before D2 really was around, so going back into the 90s, um, generally that marble was being cleaned more of with a highly, highly diluted chlorine, which was calcium hypochlorite in a very high dilution. Um, it, it does clean marble with pretty it, well, actually, but um, there's some controversy if it has some negative effects. And so D2, um, there's really no controversy from the science of it. And so it's pretty much unanimously um, used by many people in the field. I'll just mention one group, a good source for information and knowledge, as well as the group that did the testing on D2 over 20 years ago, which is the NCPTT, a long acronym stands for the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. They have videos, they have all kinds of information. Um, they're a group that is kind of somewhere between the federal government and the national park system and the state of Louisiana, because that's where they're based. And Jason Church and I have collaborated many times and he's the one who does the most outreach and he does workshops like this um, nationally as well. And we have collaborated again many times and we're friends. So, um, but they tested it for five years and they tested it compared to other cleaners and the testing was wasn't just to say, yeah, it cleans it. It was to analyze the stone in a laboratory. They have all kinds of really high-tech diagnostic equipment, and it did absolutely no harm. It only removed the growth because many cleaners could remove the growth but then be helping to deteriorate the stone. And so that's why it's become the, the cleaner of choice. There are a few other things that are similar, um, but uh, it's pretty much become the top cleaner. So, um, And I'll just say one other thing. You want to generally follow what other people are doing in the field, um, significant cemeteries. Um, D2 is also used architecturally on buildings like state capitals, New York Public Library, on and on. And when there's um, conservators or um, you know architects are involved in the planning, they're only going to want to specify products that have a proven track record, that have a lot of testing. And so this, this, this goes from cleaning to everything that we're going to do, is it's better not to experiment with things we're unsure of. And so we want to use things that are tried and true and have a proven track record. And um, so that's about it. Whenever there's a project that has specifications, they would always say use potable water, water that could be also could be drank. And so that varies a lot. I mean, if a water's a little harder than others, but ultimately rainwater is coming down on this. It has a lot of impurities on a daily basis, every time it rained, maybe last night. And so, um, you know, it's good to use clean water. We don't want to use murky water, certainly. And we don't, but it does, it does um, ring a bell that I can um, say that when you get further west, especially it's very arid as I mentioned earlier and because of that grass doesn't tend to grow so a lot of the western cemeteries and I could name many places say Cheyenne Wyoming or you know and just go out in Montana you know Butte Montana anywhere out west out there um, they tend to irrigate a lot they tend to you have sprinklers to grow grass because otherwise you have like sand and you have you know more like a desert it's very like arid plains in a lot of areas but unfortunately they usually use um, irrigation water which has a lot of different mineralization with it in it. And so in some areas it has a lot of iron in it. Now if you introduce that water to the stones, you create biological growth in areas where you don't have it normally or you have very low levels of it. So having sprinklers causes biological growth, but worse than that, if it's a high iron source, it will stain all the stones, especially the marble, and they'll all turn like rust colored. If you have very high calcium or um, other mineral contents, lime, calcium, like in um, where I did a workshop 15 years ago for the city of Cheyenne, Wyoming, everything is covered with this scale of white and the stones are very disfigured and that is from the watering they're doing. 
And so the water they're introducing is, is, you know, is discoloring and disfiguring the stone. So they're, they're getting nice grass out of it, but then it's causing another problem. And I'll just jump from that to one very short story. and It'll go for full circle back to Jason Church because he got consulted by the Monument Builders of North America, which is a trade group that um, represents many of the most um, uh, diligent monument companies in America who have membership and have extra training. And, and monuments generally have a, a very long guarantee. Like when they say lifetime, I mean, it's, it, they, they should last you know, hundreds of years. And so they were having mon, modern monument, modern, sorry, <laughs> modern granite monuments, which were recently installed, say five, 10 years ago, were starting to develop cracks and, chi and, 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 and stone was slaking off in pieces and they were uh, becoming visibly damaged in, in to varying degrees incredibly quickly. And the granite monument should last for centuries. And so they investigated and it was a bit of a riddle to figure out what was going on, but it was the water again. And so and, and through the styles of aesthetics and what people are really desirous of today, black monuments have become very popular. Black polished monuments especially and black polished monuments in the sun get very, very hot and they, they absorb a lot of heat. When the sprinklers were coming on in some of these cemeteries, they were coming on at the wrong time during the day, and th those black monuments could be getting to 130, 40 degrees, and then you have this cold irrigation water hitting them. And if that happens one or two times, it's not gonna be significant. But these sprinklers kept doing it again and again, and so the sprinklers were causing the monuments literally to, 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 to break up in some situations. And so, um, so we have to be really careful with irrigation and introducing um, things that are not, you know, in the climate already. Okay, so we're going to get started here. We're going to um, work on cleaning this marble monument right here. It has a lot of biological growth on it. Um, what's standing proud of the surface is the lichens, and they're um, showing as um, kind of a, a yellows and greens, and um, they're they're standing proud of the surface and um, and so uh, the first thing actually before we even get into cleaning we want to make sure it's a stable monument and we're not going to exert a lot of pressure on it but still it's good to just check and I'm just going to lightly put pressure and it's actually all joined and bonded together right now which is a really good thing so we know there's not going to be any movement at all. The next thing that I recommend when people get into this is documentation and what that means specifically initially is taking photographs. I mean, 99% of the photographs today are digital. And uh, back in the day, it was 35 millimeter. It was a lot more effort and it cost. But today, uh, most people have uh, some way of taking digital pictures of the cameras. A lot, a lot of people have phones, obviously. And, um, and so anyway, uh, take pictures of it because that's the one thing that's a record of what it looked like before you did the work. And it's even more important when we're repairing broken stones. And then sometime we need to go back and make sure it's it's reading the right direction later and things like that but even so we want to document this now also documentation can and should include more information how did you clean it when did you clean it the date and things like that and you can put that on an assessment form and then you could uh, attach the photo to it and that's really a uh, complete documentation along ideally with the lot number if that exists and any other relevant information um, but anyway um, this is a gray marble and pure marble would be a white like a Carrara marble, um, but if there's other minerals that are um, sprinkled into the mix before it solidifies um, geologically, it can ch change to um, white with veining through it, or it can turn into more of an overall gray color. And um, so a tremendous amount of marble was quarried and created into monumental works uh, throughout the second part of the 1800s into the middle, especially the early of the 1900s. Um, so without any further ado, we're going to get started and work on cleaning this. Um, actually, a little background information, what we don't want to do. And so certainly um, on the top of the list, we don't want to use any really um, harsh Chemicals like bleach is commonly something that has been used historically to clean stone. Bleach will kill all this growth, 
but it will also damage the stone. It will get into the pores of the stone. It'll actually get lodged in there and cause future damage, especially on a white marble. It'll actually stain it and it'll create like a tan, almost a light pink um, color to it that is then later impossible to remove. And so we definitely don't want to use bleach. We also don't want to use any um, really aggressive uh, mechanical methods like wire brushes. We want to use just soft bristle brushes and we want to use plenty of water. Um, now, additionally, we're also going to use um, uh, the stone cleaner. It's become the top cleaner for historic gravestones and monuments in America, which is called D2 Biological Solution. And um, it's used all over America at places like Mount Auburn, the first um, garden cemetery, and, and on and on. So, um, so we're gonna just move forward and we're gonna start cleaning the stone. Um, just a couple more other like monument companies. Um, I'll just mention um, oftentimes, you know, they're the place that uh, people would go to for, for information and knowledge. Many times they are not experienced with the historical stones and they may be very knowledgeable about the modern monuments, but um, not so much about the historical stones. So they tend to wanna clean with acids and pressure washers. And so we don't wanna use any of those things on marble either. And just overall, marble is very affected by acid rain and acids in general. So we never want to introduce an acid to it. And so marble in inner cities, anywhere that's more populated, um, especially in uh, polluted areas, are going to be very badly deteriorated. And so if you go further west uh, into the really arid areas in America, the marble is going to be in much better condition. And it's incredible, actually, when you get into areas like parts of Utah, and New Mexico and Nevada and that whole region, you'll actually see marble like this that has polish on it still. And people have to understand that these were originally shiny polished stones and all the way it's rough now to touch, it's because that has all worn away through weathering. And the biggest source of weathering is moisture. And then if you have moisture and pollution over the course of time, um, it tends to wear away the stones. One of the reasons, one of many reasons that we've moved over to granite monuments in modern installations starting in the late 1800s and definitely transitioning by World War I, fewer and fewer marble monuments were installed. So we're gonna move forward and we're gonna start cleaning the stone. And so we're gonna just use a few simple tools. And this right here has um, got a lot of raised lichen on it. So what we're gonna do is just start with some water and all that, this is just a simple handheld pump sprayer with water in it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is just wet this down. And the reason we're gonna wet it down first, it's actually a little damp already from the rain we've had here previously, but we wanna um, loosen up this, this um, lichen a little, but also we don't wanna scrape it dry because otherwise it's gonna aerate all the spores and we're going to get them on us and we're going to breed them. And so if we wet it down, it's going to scrape off much better and, um, and, and it's not going to make dust. Okay, so we're going to start by doing that and then we're going to go into using um, a plastic scraper and we can use also um, some other things that are soft like a paint stirrer, a soft wood. And the idea is that this will wear away quickly and it's a disposable tool okay these are less than a dollar in cost and they last you know for a fair amount of time but they start to wear down slowly because the stone is um, is rough and so this is a soft plastic I like these because they're flexible they bend easily and they're uh, softer plastic so not all plastics are the same and in fact there's a great range and some are very hard and very brittle and we want to stay away from those so we have a soft plastic scraper here and so we're gonna go ahead now I already wet it down and we're gonna just go ahead and scrape a lot of this off now they don't always have lichen like this obviously um, but the ones that do we can start by using the scraper so if there's nothing raised to scrape we're not gonna spend the time now also I can keep rinsing as I go a little bit so I can see what's going on here and and um, and I'm just gonna get the heavy stuff because we're gonna move on to brushes in a moment and we're gonna talk about brushes next okay so um, as far as a monument like this, this is a, um, a lower base, an upper base, and then the headstone portion. And just as I'm cleaning, I'm um, going to continue with uh, just getting it nice and moist down here. 
and getting the heavy lichen. It doesn't always come off this easily. There's a big range in, in how tenacious and aggressive lichens can be depending on the, the exact, um, you know, what the growth is, but as well as the climate it's in and the type of stone that it's on. So I'm gonna concentrate on the, the, the three sides that are facing, um, facing everybody here so we can, so we can see the process. And so um, some people have read um, in different sources about cleaning um, from the bottom up. And so there's a lot of questions, should we clean from the bottom up or the top down? And the bottom line is this, the way we're cleaning here with this solution, it's more logical to clean from the top down. Um, if, you re if you sometimes read things there, um, relevant to other subject matter and so um, the theory of cleaning from the bottom up is coming is, a re is relevant but in different situations and so in architecture if you're cleaning a multi-story building it's really good to clean from the bottom up if you're using like a, a typical restoration cleaner which is acidic because the fear is that if you start at the top the runoff will stay in the bottom and etch into it. And so by the time you get to the bottom, it might be impossible to clean. With D2, that is not a relevant subject because it does not, we can always spray a little more on. So there's no issue there. So there's no possible um, side effects to that. So, um, so I will continue now. And I did a basic scraping, got the heavy stuff. Obviously I could do a little more. Um, so I'll move on to brushes and we'll have a little discussion about brushes and um, and so we want to use a soft bristle brush I'll say that again soft bristle brush <laughs> when we um, start to scrub and um, so I'm gonna start with a traditional fiber this is called Tempico and it's a natural bristle it's very soft and actually it absorbs a lot of moisture these have been used um, for brushes and other purposes um, for, a, for a very long time, hundreds of years. And um, today they mostly come from agave um, and um, they get softer when they get wet. They absorb a lot of um, moisture. Uh, on the downside, they're harder to clean after you use them and they take a long time to dry out, but it's very soft and friendly to the stone. Um, so this is a small new um, Tempico brush. Now brushes come in different shapes and sizes and um, and so um, this one actually is, is a bit soiled from yesterday, should be cleaned better. It's actually the same fiber. This is also Tempico. And so this is called a plating brush. This is a historic brush um, shape that was used, um, you know, in, in trades in, in earlier America. Um, so we're going to move forward and actually do the cleaning. I'm going to start with just this little brush here. And um, um, actually, I'll just say a few more words. Um, synthetic fibers are going to be what you're going to find on most of the brushes today. And this is like a nylon bristle, OK? And so um, and they don't look that different, but when you touch it, you'll feel the difference. And so a synthetic bristle is it can be made of poly or nylon. There's a bunch of different, um, obviously, kind of plastics. But we're looking for one that's softer. And so these can be quite aggressive, and we certainly don't want that. We want something that's pretty flexible and soft. Most of the brushes you're going to find in hardware stores and home centers today are going to tend to be synthetic. Synthetics. They have less and less of the of the natural fiber, although historically this is primarily what you were going to see. Um, and so um, these are the, the advantages of these versus the Tempico. They're going to be um, easier to clean after we use them, and they're going to dry more quickly. Um, it's not going to soften up as much, so the bristles don't really absorb any moisture, and they won't really change at all. And so this is a little more aggressive than the Tempico. However, also it has to do with how hard we push and how much water we use. And so we don't want to give a lot of pressure. We want to just uh, lightly kind of skate over the stone and we want to use a lot of water. Water is a really good lubricant. Okay, this is called a fender brush and this is called, uh, it's kind of a version of a block brush and um, just that you hold with your hand. This is more of a handle on it. And then this here is just a longer handle um, and another style um, of a fender 
brush. And then also, I'll just mention, um, we can use smaller brushes. Um, these are not metal. They look, some people think this is metal. And this is a nylon. There's not that many bristles on it. And um, this is like more of a tile and grout brush. These are okay also. They're a little more aggressive. But if we're lightly uh, putting pressure on and using water, these are also safe to use. And these will go into recesses. And if there's carving or details, um, then um, it's easier to get to all those spaces with the smaller brush. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and, um, and come back with, um, actually, we're going to come in with the, with the D2 right now. And um, so this is undiluted D2 that's just in a quart bottle, and I'm just going to spray the stone. And this also comes in gallons and five-gallon containers, but these little uh, spray nozzle quarts are very convenient, and, um, and you, all you have to do is... Um, is screw the, the nozzle on the top and then you're good to go. Um, it's gonna work best undiluted on a stone that is, um, has a lot of staining on it. Um, if this uh, was already clean once and a few years later it starts to come back, we could do a mix with about 50% D2 and that would probably um, clean it really well. So in a workshop setting and with volunteers and things, usually this is about the way we're gonna do it. Spray it on, give it a little time to um, kind of soak in, and then we're gonna brush and rinse. Now, it has been proven that this is also safe to use in a different way, especially on bigger monuments or if you're doing a lot of cleaning, and we could just spray it on the stone and literally walk away. It's gonna be very slow in effect though. So if you're looking for a quick result, that's not gonna occur, but it is safe for the stone this is not going to have any detrimental effects and it's not cleaning with acid it has a slightly alkaline pH and pH is the scale from 0 to 14 7 is neutral in the middle most rainwater is varying degrees of slightly acidic um, a lot of the cleaners used today in architecture are very acidic on the low level of the pH scale this is slightly alkaline and it's um, a pH around I believe 9 or 8 actually um, not sure exactly offhand um, so anyway we usually let that sit on there for a few minutes just like it is right now and then we're just going to get started and and do the cleaning process so sometimes we'll get an immediate color change that's going to tend to happen when it's um, warmer conditions and it depends on the type of growth but sometimes we'll have a color bloom and so in other words this will all of a sudden it'll turn brighter like almost an orange or like a, a bright yellow like it'll get a color change and so some people um, obviously if they're not experienced with this will be concerned with that you can liken that it's a different actual process from a chemistry point of view but it is similar to the process of leaves changing colors on deciduous trees before they fall off the tree okay so we're going to come in right now we're going to introduce a little more water and then we're just going to start brushing i'm going to pre-wet this brush a little this was a new tempico brush and I'll just mention all of these brushes are from Magnolia Brush in Texas, which is the last major American brush manufacturer, believe it or not. Now there are a few others, but most of them are just importing their brushes, so they actually make these in Texas. They've been making them since the 1800s. So we're just gonna work it right down the front here. Now, generally, I mean, we don't want to just do one motion in the same direction, so more of a random kind of motion is good. And, um, and just to get into the inscription from different angles, so I'll just run down the stone one more time and just give it a general cleaning. And, um, and I'll come around and do the same thing over here. I'm better with my right hand, but I can use my left hand too. And try not to block the view. Okay, and I'll hit this side quickly, and, um, and then we'll come around and start uh, seeing how, how much improved this could be. This is going to be a great example. Um, they don't always clean up as quickly. When there's raised lichen, if it's not really well attached, it'll tend to be a very impressive change very quickly. Um, if it's the darker staining tends to be molds that are under the surface, and they're, uh, more, they're more slow to clean. Um, so we can move on to a bigger sprayer. And so this one actually is really innovative. It has a lithium ion battery, so we don't have to pump. 
and we're going to come in here and we're going to have immediate you see how the color of the water coming off is the judge of how much cleaning we're doing this is a pretty phenomenal end result so it's a perfect time to come in with one of these detail brushes this has a regulator and a pump it'll stay in just about 20 pounds pressure and it'll come on and off as needed and um, so I can see that that other brush um, that small block brush it kind of skated over these recesses because there's incise details within the stone so again the stone is really still very wet I'm not putting much pressure on it's cleaning up beautifully and so this is um, in a lot of places where they have really aggressive lichens they would, they would love to have a stone like this because this cleans up beautifully. And um, it's interesting too that the, mar the white marble historically was the most desirable. Um, this is kind of um, coming from Greek revival and, just the, and also Italy and Europe. And um, people generally wanted the white marbles. They were the most expensive. However, in more cases than not, the gray marble tends to hold up better to weathering. And that's from the um, other minerals within it. Marble starts out basically as shells, like oysters, clams, all shells in oceans, salt water. Eventually those shells, you know, their lifespan's not that long, those organisms, and those shells eventually get broken down into sand. That sand at the bottom of ancient ocean beds uh, turns into limestone with mineral binders. And then if it gets metamorphosized, which is heat and pressure um, underground in geologic time, then it will convert um, limestone into marble. One of the ways you can tell the difference is limestone will usually have fossils in it. And uh, when it gets metamorphosized, which is heat and pressure underground in geologic time, um, when it gets metamorphosized and gets converted to marble, so limestone and marble are like brother and sister almost, and um, at least in a basic geological sense. And once it gets um, converted, it will tend to destroy all the fossils in the limestone and it will crystallize instead. So usually in marble, if you see it in the proper lighting, you could see crystals and you generally won't see fossils. Um, both limestone and marble are very susceptible to acids. And so you'd never want to introduce any kind of ac acidic cleaners to them or it will be detrimental. So this is a very, uh, this is a great example. This cleaned up really nicely. So just a few other things that um, this will look better and better as it dries because the stone will become lighter in color. Um, stone that's wet is always a darker color. Now additionally, there's gonna be, there's some mold and things under the surface and the D2 is gonna have a residual effect and so it's gonna keep cleaning even after the stone is dry. What's gonna happen is um, it'll basically, all the cells will stop communicating once it totally dries out, but then every time it rains again, it will reactivate it because there's gonna be a little bit of the, of the cleaning, uh, of the active cleaning chemical, which is quaternary ammoniums. Um, they're gonna still remain in the stone and they're not harmful, um, but what they'll do is they'll keep, they'll keep cleaning after we leave and so it'll get cleaner. And then it will also have what's called a prophylactic effect. It'll tend to keep the mold from coming back, all the biological growth from coming back for a period of time, usually at least a year or many times a lot longer. <clears throat> so I think we're, uh, we're pretty good on this. I'll just come around to this side a little more. Use a slightly different brush. Really cleaned up beautifully. All the lichen is off now. And um, the lower base always has the least, at least historical significance. And I mean, we don't want to harm it, but um, you know, it's not where the inscription is and it's not generally what people are focusing on. Let's go one more time. And um, now that I've cleaned it up this much, I can see this was definitely reset because I can see some kind of more modern material squeezing out. Um, fortunately, the bond is still holding up, and so it's stable. It's leaning at a, at a tiny bit, but it's not um, significant. So uh, all this needs is cleaning, and, um, and we don't really have to do anything else to it.
So that about completes the cleaning demonstration of Gray Marble Monument.